Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Thank you for joining us. Part two of our in-depth interview with Dr. Frame and my grandson, Justin Bailey. He is studying philosophy, so this part two, the subject matter still about the history of Western philosophy and theology. A phenomenal book. You'll see it on the screen. Dr. Frame has written about how many books, Dr. Frame? 20 or so. 20 or so. That means he's got about five more ready. Right now, the interview starts. Justin, take it away. I wanted to start real quick uh, from our interview um, just a little bit ago. You, we got to this towards the tail end, um, but you, you made mention and you make it clear in your book as well that you, you see it, it's hard for you to differentiate between theology and philosophy. You, you don't draw too, uh, too many distinctives between the disciplines themselves. It, can you explain what you mean more and how they overlap with each other and, and why it is that you think some people are wrong to try to maybe distinguish philosophy from theology? No. Well, you rem remember uh, last time, Justin, I defined uh, philosophy as uh, the, the attempt to uh, explain and uh, defend a uh, worldview. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a Christian. I, I hold to the biblical worldview as I understand it. Uh, so when I explain that, I talk about the creator and I talk about the creation and talk about the fall into sin and talk about the various... Uh, uh, talk about ethics uh, from that point of view, but uh, I also talk about the atonement. I talk about when Jesus died for our sins. I talk about so what what is philosophy and what is theology? They right. just sort of merge together, and uh, uh, so that they can't really be very well. Uh, separated from one another. Are there some things you tend to call philosophy instead of theology and, and vice versa? And what well, makes you make that distinction? Yeah, so distinction? that's what this is about. There is a history mm -hmm. and some kinds of problems have been traditionally called philosophical problems and some other ones are called theological. So uh, if you're talking about Plato's forms or you're talking about rationalism versus empiricism, you call those issues philosophical, but uh, mm -hmm. if you're talking about uh, creation or the atonement or uh, uh, salvation by grace, you usually call that uh, uh, theological. Um, I, I think, though, that if, if, if there weren't a fall, if we were all believers in the Lord, uh, mm -hmm. there wouldn't really be any need for a differentiation. We, we discuss all these issues within the uh, biblical worldview, and uh, uh, there wouldn't be any need to separate uh, philosophy from theology. Right, and since we're, since we're not, unfortunately, worldwide believers, that brings me to, because your, your book is, is, so, is so vast and it covers so many things, it's, it's able to be, you know, read in bite-sized chunks because you break the sections up really well, but um, one of the focuses, and it seems to be a focus from lots of the other books that you've, that you've written over the years, is, is in some way or form focused on the discipline of apologetics. Um, and that was something that actually drew me into even studying philosophy and theology. I kind of stumbled into apologetics. I never, I never heard of it growing up. Grew up a Christian mm. in, in, in a, you know, that community. But apologetics, I probably encountered it, but I never really grasped, grasped what it was. Um, and when I did, I encountered it through a few different people, some of which, you know, popular level people like Tim Keller at Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City, mm -hmm. um, and then some more of the, you know, the, the, the intellectuals maybe you, you don't hear about on the popular level. Um, can you define for us, and I want to focus maybe in, on that for this show, uh, apologetics and kind of the distinctions there. Um, can you define for us what apologetics is and, and how is it connected to evangelism or, or in what sense does the, does the Bible make a case that this is, this is an, an application of our commission? Well, my uh, life text for ap apologetics is uh, 1 Peter 3.15, which says that uh, be, we should be ready to uh, answer anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that is in us mm -hmm. with meekness and fear. 
Uh, I think that's King James. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it does, but, it does uh, read well. But uh, and, and it begins. I forgot the beginning of it, which is so important. Uh, sanctify the Lord Christ in your heart. So this is not a discipline where we sort of push Christ aside so mm-hmm. we can prove him to an unbeliever. But this is a situation where especially we, we appeal to the lordship of Christ. Right. So uh, it's you can define apologetics as the... As the discipline, the way you train one another to uh, give answers to mm-hmm. people who ask those kinds of questions. Right. I think there are three aspects to it. Uh, one is uh, proof. If somebody asks you uh, uh, why you believe uh, uh, that uh, uh, God is one uh, substance and three persons, you, you just give the answer. You give the biblical answer, explain why that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, The second uh, aspect of it is uh, defense, when somebody attacks uh, the Christian faith from a non-Christian position. And the third uh, uh, aspect is uh, offense, where you uh, take the lead and you try to show, now this is what's wrong with uh, uh, Islam, this is what's wrong with uh, empiricism and so on. Right. And you, like everything else, it seems to be as I as I continue studying these, is there's always that another layer of complexity, and there and there are different methodologies of how to do apologetics within, you know, once once people say I, I I think apologetics is a great tool that we need to be using, and then there's the next question, well, how do we do it? What's what's the way in which to do it? And there seems to be kind of three big category ideas maybe that that I've at least stumbled upon in in my time um, looking at this. And it falls into something called classicalism, evidentialism, and presuppositionalism. Could you, could you explain what the differences are in, in a sense, how it is, is if there are subtle differences, what, what are those differences and why is one better than the other, let's say? Well, um, there are a, a number of uh, further differentiations that you might make there, but yeah. the, uh, just taking the ones you mentioned, mm-hmm. the uh, presuppositionalism, is an approach to apologetics where you uh, say, well, uh, I'm a Christian, I I have certain uh, convictions as to the, that are fundamental to everything that I think, everything that I say, and those are called presuppositions. Mm -hmm. And so I I appeal to those in my argument and I try to show uh, the non-believer that uh, unless he presupposes the truth of Scripture, unless he presupposes the lordship of Jesus Christ, he can't come up with a co- coherent worldview. Right. Okay. Uh, then classical apologetics basically is in two phases. The first phase is you prove the existence of God by rational arguments, mm-hmm. like the causes, you know, this right. cause. Uh, uh, brings about this effect. And, so there must be an ultimate so, cause. And so you keep going back right. and back and back, and you say there must be one first cause. Right. That was uh, Aristotle's argument, and Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas did right. it differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's uh, the first phase. And then the second phase is you uh, present the uh, evidences for the Christian faith. So you're there you're not just proving the existence of God. You're proving that uh, what the Bible says about Jesus is, is true. Right. And then the uh, third one, uh, what name did you give it? Oh, e- evidentialism. Evidentialism says you, uh, you don't really need two steps. Mm-hmm. The evidentialist says uh, all you need to do is show the evidence. If you can show that Luke is correct and that, uh, that Paul is right and that uh, Matthew is is right, then you've proved the existence of God already. You right. don't need to have any rational proof of the existence of God because you've already got it. Right. So those are three... And one of the things yeah. with, within that category that, that you say in the book that you, you're not a big fan of is that it, it leaves the conclusion in realms of probability and not certainty. And you think, um, and you believe that within the biblical worldview, certainty is what we should be appealing to and not probability, and my my question goes: Okay, I see, I see that. What is what are what are the things that super high probabilities? Let's say ninety nine point five percent or something like that. We we tend to use that all the time as almost practical certainty. 
is there a difference in that 0.5%, let's say, in the, and is that the distinction of the methodologies in the sense that almost drives why you don't think that's a good, good method? Well, I, uh, my position is a little more complicated than that. I think there is a place. You mean place, I didn't spell it out in 20 I think seconds? <laughs> I think there's a place for probability and probable arguments and so on, and I, I do explain that in my uh, book called Apologetics, a Basis for Chris, uh, Justification for Christian Belief. Right. But uh, I, I think that the, the, the evidence that God has given us mm -hmm is not just probable, it's certain. I'm thinking of Romans chapter 1. Mm -hmm. See there it says that the, the, the invisible things of God are clearly uh, expressed in the things that are made mm -hmm. so that people are without excuse. Right. And Paul is talking about people who, who are outside of Judaism. They don't have any access to the Bible. They're just looking at the natural world. And, mm -hmm. Paul says, if you just look at the natural world, then there's plenty of evidence for God there. In fact, right. it's, it's perfectly clear. Now, when I see his language about clarity, right. I translate that into the term certainty. Right. That is, when we look at the evidence God has provided, it's certain to the extent, and you can define certainty in an ethical way. You can say right. that... Uh, uh, what certainty means is that I have no excuse right. if I disagree with it. And you think if there's even a little sliver of, of probability that it may not be, that leaves just enough of a hairline excuse to like crack the door open? Yeah, well, God, God doesn't allow for any sliver of uh, uncertainty. I mean, when Paul says it's uh, clear, he means it's clear. It's 100%. Uh, you know, we're in a different situation from from God. God can present evidences that are certain, absolutely certain, right. but when I'm presenting evidence to a friend of mine who's right. an unbeliever, I can't be sure that my arguments perfectly represent that divine evidence. Right. And so my arguments may, may not be absolutely certain. And right. So I might say to him, look, I, I think there's a pretty good argument, but I'm not 100% sure. Sure, yeah. You know? So there's a difference between saying God is absolutely certain and saying that my argument yeah. is absolutely sure. certain. Now, I do think the, um, a further point about that yeah. <laughs> is that uh, uh, when uh, a person uh, comes, to, comes to Jesus and the Holy Spirit plants faith mm -hmm. in his heart, in other words, gives them a new presupposition, gives them a new way of thinking that uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit confers certainty upon that person, not certainty of every theological issue, but certainty that God is real mm -hmm. and that Jesus Christ is Lord and, and uh, all the fundamental uh, aspects of our faith. Right. On Romans 1, that, when you brought that up, I had, a, I had a little thought on there, and I was curious to see what you thought. Um, you, you, this, this verse comes up often in your book. Um, this, this set of this passage comes up often. Um, and I was, I was interested to, to, to know or for you to explore more of what you, what you think is meant by the word know God, that, that they know God. Um, and I'm thinking of, let's say, I'm thinking of an unbeliever who potentially has never never heard of Jesus or the gospel or something like that. What do they have? Do, do you think that Paul is meaning to to um, communicate that they know that there's a transcendent reality that's outside of them and that they they aren't God? They know that, or or are you saying something stronger? Something that they know something about the fundamental nature of God and that that in a sense should lead them to Christian theism. Yeah, you know, uh, I think that uh, there's a very strong sense of know there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as we speak in English about knowing uh, stuff, sometimes we talk about knowing propositions, that is, knowing that certain things are true. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's a napkin on the table. Right. But sometimes we, we speak about knowing persons. Mm -hmm. It's not knowing that, it's knowing him or knowing her. And so I can say I, I know Joe because he's a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's the sense that Paul is uh, bringing up in Romans 1. It's a personal knowledge of God. Now, not in context, not knowing God as a friend because 
these people are rebellious. They're, Paul says they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Right. But it's not just knowing facts about God. It's not just knowing that God exists. It's, it's knowing him. They, they, they are cr confronted with him in a very so the truth that personal way. Right, so the truth that, that you see that them suppressing is not the truth of that they're not God and that there's something outside. It, it's far stronger. It's, it's there, there is a personal being that's transcendent and I know him or her, whatever pronouns the person would be using in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know them personally like I know you. Is it in the sense like I'm, I would be suppressing knowledge of you? Is that what you, is that what you mean? Yes, but of course, uh, knowledge of a person mm -hmm. entails knowledge of facts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if they reject God and uh, uh, they they say, "I don't want to be his friend. I don't want to uh, bow down to him," right. then very often that will take the uh, that will have the implication of saying, uh, "I at least telling other people, I don't believe that there's a transcendent being." And that's one way of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Sure. There are others, uh, you know, the Pharisees uh, of Jesus' day uh, were willing to confess that God existed. And mm -hmm. They confessed many true things about God, uh, but they disobeyed Him in their, in their conduct. So that's a way of suppressing the truth So also. there are different levels of truth that one gets. That's right. And yeah. how you suppress it may be different depending on the context. It's, it's united in this personal knowledge, but then the personal knowledge fans out into all these uh, specific kinds of knowledge. Right. One of the major figures you cover um, in your modern section on, on Christian philosophers is a guy by the name of Cornelius Van Til. And you studied He was under, my teacher. He was yeah. your teacher. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about about him, his influence on you, um, his influence on on what what was what is presuppositional apologetics. He's he's one of the key players, I would I would say, in developing that that idea uh, more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's his what's his influence been like on you, and 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 maybe just a little bit about about who he was, and and since you knew him so well. Yeah, he was born in the Netherlands, and. Uh Grew up in the United States, uh, went to uh, uh, Calvin College, Cal Calvin Preparatory School, Calvin, uh, <laughs> it was all in the right, yes. Dutch right Calvinist the community. <laughs> but uh, uh, after he went to Calvin Seminary for a year, he left there and went to Princeton Seminary, which was an American Presbyterian school. Mm. And uh, although there was at least one Dutch professor on the faculty, it wasn't uh, part of the Dutch culture, the way these other places were. And right. uh, so he, he, he learned two things. One, from his Dutch background, especially Abraham Kuyper, uh, that uh, uh, we need to live and think always according to Christian presuppositions, that God is Lord of, of everything, all aspects of life and culture and so on. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that he learned from the Princeton guys, especially B.B. Warfield and some others, uh, that it's necessary to communicate the lordship of God uh, in, uh, in arguments that are, that are sound and cogent and persuasive mm -hmm. to people who don't believe. Right. So uh, he uh, came out, uh, I, I wrote a book on Van Til too, so it's right. hard for me to... <laughs> Maybe focus in on, on, his, on, his, on his transcendental argument. Maybe on, mm -hmm. on how he frames conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one thing that st stuck out to me is, is, is a quote, I think this is, this is you, this isn't you quoting him, but to assume common ground is in a sense, it, it implies that the world makes sense even if God did not create it. Yet that is not really common ground. It's a capitulation to a non-Christian world, world view. And if the apologist begins by assuming a non-Christian worldview, he has lost the battle from the outset. So, you, so, so he's arguing that if you even come to the table with common ground in the sense of maybe logic or some form of reason that, that you may share with a non-believer or even another believer of another, of another faith, 
you, in a sense, have capitulated your worldview. Could you, could you illumine that a bit? Well, common ground is a kind of a vague expression, and there are some senses in which we have all kinds of common ground with, with non-Christians. We believe that the sky is blue. We mm -hmm. believe that the uh, planets revolve around the sun, and Hopefully. so on and so forth. Yeah. So for, for the most part, I mean, we, mm -hmm. we know that we live in the same world, and we need to deal with the, with the same things. But uh, uh, what Van Til is concerned about is, is the presupposition See, what he learned from, from the Dutch is that we have to always think according to biblical presuppositions. What he learned from Warfield is that we've got to uh, uh, use this presuppositional knowledge to uh, communicate clearly with people who don't believe that. And so uh, he developed the system of presuppositionalism, which means that you, you presuppose what's in the Bible but you try to show to the non-believer that unless he presupposes the same, he can't make sense out of the world. Now, that's what's meant by transcendental argument. Right. Transcendental argument is an argument to show that... Raise the, above the... Uh, it, right. And unless you uh, hold to my presuppositions, uh, you can't even make sense uh, of the ones you have. Van Til told a story about... Uh, uh, time that he was riding on the train and mm -hmm. he saw a man in the other aisle with his little daughter on his lap and she was uh, slapping him and, and she was mad at him for something and, uh, and Van Til commented that uh, uh, even though she was angry with her father, right. uh, she was uh, depending on him. She, she couldn't stand. She, right. she couldn't do anything unless she was sitting there on his lap. And so uh, that's what Van Til taught us to do in apologetic conversations to show that uh, you know you can't even complain about uh, the Bible. I mean, you, what's what, you, you're presupposing that uh, the world is a meaningful world, right? And that the the world holds together in a uh, con, in a clear kind of way, logical way. Now, how can you do justice to that if you deny that there's a God? Yeah. And uh, that, that's the kind of argument that he uh, developed. Let me close with a, a couple of questions. Um, as, I, as I'm studying this, I'm trying to do the same thing, right? I, I'm trying to look at, at scripture and, and you know, the, the traditions as we, as we come to see them um, and develop uh, an apologetic that is as biblical as possible, is as, is as wise as possible, all these, all these things coming together. Um, and I, I keep hitting this this area that I feel is maybe underdeveloped within within Christian apologetic discussions, at least between Christians, um, and it gets back to to Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17 and and Paul in, in Ephesians 4. Um, and let me just read what what Christ was saying there in the high priestly prayer. I, I do not ask for these only, meaning these people that he was referring to that he's praying for their for their well and their and their life moving forward. Um, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Um, Paul puts it in, in clear terms that there, there's one God, one faith, one baptism. What's the role of ecumenism, which is Christian unity and, and finding ways to move forward in the, in the vast diversity that is Christianity at, the, at this junction of history. What's the way forward so that, we can, so that we can follow Christ's idea that the world will believe if we're one in him and in each mm. other? Well, that's something that I've been concerned about all my life. You know, there are yeah. f something like 40,000 denominations. Something along that, those lines. World. Yeah. And, uh, you know, non-believers look at that and they say, oh, you Christians can't even agree among yourselves. I mean, right. you've got 40,000 disagreements. You can't even have fellowship together. Why, yeah. why, why how can you expect you're... me to, right. to go along with all of this? And, and I think that really... Uh, Unity is a powerful apologetic. Is, when yeah. when non-Christians uh, 
uh, see how Christians love each other. You know, that was that came from the early church that uh, mm-hmm. the pagans said how vo- how these Christians right. love one another. Mm-hmm. And when that becomes a reality, uh, then uh, uh, that, that's a powerful thing. And, and I think often uh, Christian faith is caught rather than taught. You know, a, a lot of people, a lot of converts have said to me that uh, uh, they didn't really come to Christ through some argument or other, but they came to Christ because they, they were uh, uh, invited to uh, uh, have dinner with somebody or they were brought to a church a gathering or something like that, and they, they were received as gracious and, and so on, and they thought, you know, I'd really like to be part of that community. Yeah. I, I, I kind of wish it were true. Yeah. <laughs> and then they started exploring right. the issues in a little different way, mm-hmm. from a different presupposition, right. maybe. So, so, you're, so you think, well, doctrines, how do, we, how do we face these realities? People believe very different things in the Christian community. What's the way forward? How do we, how do we resolve some of these issues so that people may believe? Well, right. for, for one thing, we need to read the Bible a lot more carefully and, and see what it actually teaches and, and not just uh, force it to uh, settle in with our traditions and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that, that's, that's an important thing. The other thing I, what was it that I was thinking of a moment ago? <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Well, this is, yeah. this is tape, uh, live, tape, live yeah. on tape. We're hitting the end anyway, uh, so that's good. <laughs> But uh, no, I, I, I think that uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, unity of, of the church is just such a tremendous uh, thing, and uh, uh, I think that uh, we need to uh, uh, first of all get clear on, on what the doctrines are, what the doctrines say, and then uh, secondly, we need to talk to one another and mm-hmm. say, is this doctrine really okay we have a doctrinal difference you're premillennial and I'm amillennial or something uh, do you really think that we have to belong to two different churches because of that can't we right. reconcile this difference and and worship together even Absolutely. though we may be a little bit that's different the hope. Our, that's the, that's yeah, the hope yeah. Dr. Frame thank you so much thank you Justin Appreciate it. wow the word of God 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the Bible. I hope you've written the web down and all of the information available to you so that this phenomenal book that we've talked about in two parts will be a part of your library. I'm telling you, it will take you probably a couple of months to get through it, and then you'll want to take about another six months to really understand what it's talking about. It is the way we all know the Word of God and the way we study the Word of God. God bless you for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.